So I'll speak primarily about diabetes with the recognition that cardiovascular disease is a comorbidity and the uh, cause of most diabetes complications and ultimately uh, mortality rates in diabetes. And as far as frame of reference, I'm talking about type 2 diabetes in this talk, which is mediated by lifestyle, and I will not be addressing type 1 diabetes. So let me start with the case for improving equity in diabetes and why we need a population level approach. And here I'm going to say a bit about the United States because um, I'm going to show an example of one of the most astounding uh, effective uh, research to policy to practice examples in the United States to date. Um, but of course, diabetes at the global level is increasing exponentially in prevalence and in costs. But in the US, one in 10 people has diabetes. And importantly, one in every three adults has prediabetes. People with prediabetes are likely to develop type 2 diabetes within the next one to five years. It's imminent. In 2017, the total economic costs of diagnosed diabetes in the U.S. was $327 billion. That's an annual cost. And very importantly, diabetes is ranked number one among all health care conditions in the U.S. in combined public health and health care spending. And for health care, this includes, of course, hospitalizations, emergency, and other types of care for people with diabetes. It is, like all of the diseases and, um, and conditions we're talking about today, one of inequities by demography and by geography, although we have such high prevalence and incidence rates in the United States, they are particularly concentrated in particular states. We have um, a diabetes belt in the lower southeast part of the country that's responsible for many of these numbers. And this is a disease mediated by behavioral and social determinants, which account for up to 70% of the disease. And so in the United States, the National Academy of Medicine and its Population Health Roundtable are truly leading the country in thought and strategies for implementing population health. The American Diabetes Association and our stakeholders and many behavioral and public health researchers have adopted population health as the path forward for diabetes to arrest the numbers and the epidemic in our, in our country, but also globally. And so we have a diabetes population health model that has been modeled after the Institute for Health Innovations population health model. And what you'll see here, and this originates with the, uh, with the generic population health model from IHI, health equity is really the, the overarching uh, goal of population health programming. Population health realizes and acknowledges that within a population there are going to be um, um, a stratification of risks and of outcomes. And in order to be effective at a population level, it's going to be important to ensure, and from our healthcare framework, we phrase it as, we want to ensure that people get the right interventions or the right care in the right place, at the right time, and with the right workforces. And so what you see here is that continuum, the arrow from risk of diabetes onset through the risk of the uh, most uh, extreme complications of diabetes, and really a joining of public health and medical care sets of interventions. I want to draw your attention to that gray box, and in the middle, you'll see that no matter what part of the continuum we are intervening upon, it is critical that we leverage multi-sector partnerships, so that's health and public health, but also uh, sectors such as education, uh, such as finance and economics, that we look at the um, partnerships between communities and clinics and, critically, policy. 
So what I'll do today is, is give one example of a population health improvement intervention. And I'll just emphasize here that the population health improvement end of the spectrum focuses on the proactive initiatives, much of what we've been speaking about today. There is also a population health management end of the spectrum, and in my work with, with healthcare systems, they're all focused on management. They define their populations as uh, patient populations within their walls and doors for which they are responsible. But today we'll just focus on population health improvement uh, intervention for diabetes. These really are designed to reduce the need for individuals to enter healthcare systems by addressing behavioral and social determinants that give rise to care that otherwise could have been avoided. So diabetes is a behaviorally demanding disease. There are several behaviors. It's a complex condition. Um, and there are several behaviors that are necessary for effective management of the disease, and these are the seven uh, from the American Association of Diabetes Educators, which standardizes diabetes care in America, uh, education and support in America. Notice problem solving is there. Decision making is deemed an essential self-care behavior. And these self-care behaviors exist, of course, in the context of social determinants. And these are the primary social determinants that we talk and think about in diabetes and have to plan for as we're thinking about interventions. And during uh, the uh, panel discussion, I'm happy to talk more specifically about the social determinants and particular types of interventions on those determinants. Uh, today, I'll be sharing an example that addresses those uh, in the, as a part of how we implement. So the example I'd like to share today is one that demonstrates a pathway that ended up being successful uh, from research to policy and practice for an intensive lifestyle change program. And this is the US Diabetes Prevention Program. And what I'm going to go through quickly is the path itself. I think the path um, has taught us many lessons that we can generalize. Uh, and so it started with the scientific evidence, uh, NIH-funded multi-center trial, which showed, to the surprise of the investigators, I must say, that a lifestyle intervention as compared to a medication was far more effective in preventing or delaying onset of type 2 diabetes in people with prediabetes, those people at high risk of developing the disease. And this was a very structured intervention um, that um, was able to show effectiveness within one year. The uh, multicenter trial was stopped early because of the definitive results. Those results were, ch that intervention was translated uh, through um, research funded by NIH and by our Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, and developed partnerships with community-based agencies and organizations to deploy the intervention in real-world settings. Those real-world setting trials proved effective and there was a stage of national prioritizing of diabetes as a problem, pre-diabetes um, statistics, and then evidence that we can actually prevent or delay onset of type 2 diabetes. These are the agencies that were primarily involved in putting this on the national agenda. And these, uh, it includes the American Diabetes Association, which has a role both as the organization that develops and publishes the standards for medical care in diabetes. It added a chapter on lifestyle intervention to standards. Um, and ADA has a government affairs division that works directly with Congress. In 2009, the 111th Congress of the United States passed the Diabetes Prevention Act, the first of its kind, that established um, the National Diabetes Prevention Program, Lifestyle Change Program, with the CDC uh, put in an oversight role for the program. 
In that role, the CDC has been responsible for dissemination and implementation. Here I've listed just um, two aspects of, this, of what the CDC has been responsible for. The first was standardizing the intensive lifestyle intervention, and it targeted a five to seven percent weight loss, that's what was effective in the original and translational trials, via uh, physical activity, 150 minutes a week, uh, goal of physical activity and, and healthier eating through uh, healthier food choices and, and calorie uh, um, reduction. And so there are many um, processes that the CDC put in place in order to standardize how this gets disseminated and there are, are built into the program the aspects listed here for health equity. In the United States, we actually have a Plain Writing Act because of literacy issues in our general population. And I'll, again, I'll be happy to discuss in more detail uh, any of these aspects later. With the standardization of the program, our insurers have now been able to take a look at this lifestyle program as a viable option for reducing their health care costs. Our public health care coverage, our federal coverage, Medicare, which is for people 65 years or older, conducted a trial which demonstrated that even in that population, using the standardized program, they could hit the targets and it reduced costs. At the national level, although we are not jumping up and down yet, we are now seeing for the first time uh, in several decades a leveling of incidence rates in diabetes. And of course, uh, the CDC is following this very closely. Um, we'll let everyone know when we can celebrate and say we really have leveled the playing field. Um, and then there are challenges and gaps which I've put up here, scaling, further scaling, uh, maintaining program quality and fidelity, uh, as lay people deliver the program in the real world setting, and thinking about earlier intervention points on the, co on the continuum uh, before the highest risk stage for developing diabetes. Thank you.